I am joined today by some incredibly influential people in both the drone and public safety worlds who will provide a lot of insight into different methods of deployment, the benefits of using drones in patrol operations, and a deep dive into the Skydio regulatory team with an overview of the different waivers that currently exist for law enforcement operations and make patrol-led drone as first responder a reality. So with that, I'll hand it off to the team. Fritz, we'll start with you. Can you give our viewers a quick intro and a background? Sure. Thanks, Noreen. Um, my name is Fritz Reber. I'm head of public safety integration at Skydio. I've been with Skydio for over four years now. Um, prior to that, I was a uh, captain at the Chula Vista Police Department, um, also the UAS commander, and that's where I initiated the Drone as First Responder program. Worked for about a year in retirement uh, with uh, the team there, uh, Chief Kennedy and, and Vern Sully and, and others. Um, and also spearheaded the Tactical Beyond Visual Line of Sight Waiver, which Chula Vista was the first to get. And looking forward to the discussion here. Thanks, Jakey. Yeah. You want to go next? Yeah, you bet. Uh, Hey everyone, I'm Jake Stoltz. I'm part of the regulatory team uh, here at Skydio. Um, it's been almost two years for me uh, working with customers uh, and the FAA to unlock different types of advanced operations, mostly beyond visual line of sight. Uh, before I joined Skydio, I spent eight years at a UAS test site doing different kinds of UAS research and advanced operations. Um, I also spent a couple of years uh, with the Sheriff's Department here in North Dakota, actually flying small UAS, it's kind of before Part 107 when you had to have a, a pilot's license to, to even fly a small drone. Um, so I flew, flew small drones for them for a couple of years and then kind of transitioned into a, a SME for them. Um, and I do have my uh, crewed and uncrewed uh, certificates as well. So I'm a commercial pilot flight instructor. And over to you, Aaron. Awesome, thanks, Jakey. Uh, Aaron Bagley, I'm a senior solutions engineer here at Skydio. Um, I've been with the company for about three years now. Um, prior to Skydio, I got into drones about 10 years ago when I was in the National Guard. That's what got me interested. Uh, spent a large portion of my time flying a lot of uh, competitor aircraft, working with a lot of different um, agencies, manufacturers, and really working with, with public safety. Um, since joining Skydio about three years ago, um, I've been working with a lot of our teams across, uh, especially the western half of the U.S., a lot of our large um, metro police departments, as well as large sheriff departments, large deployments there, um, working over the the really the past couple of years since I've been at Skydio on the DFR approach. So we've got some customers that have now gotten enabled um, that are on that that path forward with it. So um, really, really appreciate you all being here today. I imagine there might be some friendly faces. I've been traveling all over the western half of the U.S. So. I'm sure there might be some people who uh, who, who we've met before, but uh, really appreciate everybody joining on today. Excellent, and I'm Noreen Charlton. I lead public safety strategy here at Skydio. Prior to that, I was in the world of 3D documentation for public safety scenes, and I spent more than a decade with the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department as a crime scene analyst. So next we wanna make sure that right up the bat, we are all using the same terminology. So Fritz, I will hand it over to you so we can start with patrol-led deployment. And perfect. Yeah, enough of the script. Let's get into some conversational discussion about uh, drones. So I'll lead us off. We did a webinar not too long ago that uh, talked a lot about patrol-led um, DFR and laid out some of the patrol-led deployment and, and DFR in itself and kind of how do they interrelate. You also may have seen a demo uh, at the Ascend where we demonstrated what patrol at DFR looks like. Um, so we'll go over that first and it'll really lead into some of the discussion that Aaron's gonna have in terms of working with customers today, what it looks like, what we're capable of doing. Um, and then obviously getting get into uh, Jakey talking about the regulatory structure that would be required to do these things. That Those questions came up last time we were talking about patrol at DFR, um, you know, what type of regula regulation relief is, is necessary? Where are we at in the industry? And uh, so we, we really wanna do a deeper dive on that. But of course, we gotta start with um, discussing the different types of uh, deployment methods, sort of lay the groundwork. And, and as Noreen said, like the nomenclature, so we all know what we're talking about. It's kind of like the nature of science. Uh, you know, your first year is making sure we're all speaking the same language. So learning all the terms. Um, so I'll start with patrol-led deployment. And what we kind of, 
uh, saw like you know still an early science right deployment uh, patrol operations dfr uh, drone operations in public safety, still early science. And we're learning that how you deploy drones matters as much as the type of drones you use and really would define the type of drones you use and, and the, the, the capabilities they have. Um, when people started first starting drone programs in public safety, they would, you know, hand it to those that were interested and train them and then say, hey, okay, here's your drone. And if someone needs a drone at a scene, give them a call and we'll, we'll drive out there in a system. Um, you'd either do that, sort of randomly give it to anybody who was interested, or you might give it to a specialized team, um, ESU team or a, like a, a technical assistant team, because they have the time to, to train on it and learn this advanced capability. Um, but, but then other agencies were just giving them out to patrol and realizing the value of having a drone there in the first minutes. And OKC was really the first one to sort of intentionally do this, Captain Bussert, um, Dax Laporte, they, they intentionally designed their team to get the drone there at the very first moments of an incident. Um, they called it patrol-led deployment, and basically they issued, uh, you know, in this case, Skydio drones to patrol operations. They spread the drones across different areas and beats and across the shifts, all shifts, with the idea, let, let's not just give it to the people who want to fly drones, let's give it to the people who are going to be there in the first minutes of an incident. And their first uh, role with the drone is to get it up, get it streaming, get that stream back to incident commanders, watch commanders, supervisors, um, or other responding officers, and then really showed the value of having that level of situational awareness. Someone that's at a high advantage point, looking down, sort of able to be uh, orchestrate the scene. So that's that's uh, the, the fundamental levels. And then, of course, uh, my experience at Chula Vista was thinking, how do we get drones there before people? And that's where DFR came in, if we would switch slides. Um, so DFR is defined as pre-positioned drones ready to launch in a moment's notice with the intent to get there actually before ground units. It doesn't always happen, but in most DFR programs, they'll, they'll keep stats on how often that drone does arrive. And there's really no other way to get a drone on scene rather than to have it like ready to go at a moment's notice, you're listening to 911 calls, you're, you're monitoring CAD, you're listening to the radio, you're listening for, you know, these flock activations, LPR hits, airbag deployments, shots, gunshot detection, any kind of incoming information about what's happening in your city and where, and using that to immediately launch the drone and get there. And it requires, you know, uh, some infrastructure. You need a, a drone pilot, a, a remote pilot who can um, in most cases, sit in a real-time crime center or DFR pilot room and just hit a button, launch the drone, fly it there, uh, and then get arrive on scene. And about 25% of the time, they're handling the, the incident without sending ground units. They're seeing that the, uh, you know, the fight's over, the kids are gone, there's no more tagging, um, you know, suspects have, have left. So they can clear the call with just the drone. So it's become a resource management tool as well. And in getting there first allows you to coordinate people to come into the scene and manage the scene um, correctly. And that's something that public safety hasn't had, sort of that conductor of an orchestra. We've sort of been operating at the ground level and limited by our, our you know, ability to get there quickly and to see everything that's going on from a two-dimensional route. I'll take a breath there and, and let Jake or Aaron make any comments if they had to want to add it to those two before we get into patrol-led DFR. Yeah, just to add a little bit of color there. So we did recently have an event where we had a dock that was staged up on top of a rooftop. It was um, at a large, a large event that was taking place, and there actually was a shooting that occurred during that event. The advantage of having that drone already staged on the rooftop meant that we could deploy it immediately. As soon as that, you know, as soon as that gunshot went off, as soon as the call came in, the, the drone could be launched and could start transitioning and deploying to that location. The advantage of that, I mean, so many advantages to it, but the biggest one is just the situational awareness. Having that live video feed from the drone that's on scene, being able to transmit that live video feed directly to, you know, your officers who are approaching that, who are working towards getting towards that scene, then they'll have that information. They'll know, you know, who's at the scene, what type of, you know, weapons do they have? What type of scene am I actually walking into? So that way they can tailor that approach to that scene. And then to Fritz's point earlier, sometimes there's scenes that, you know, it's a 911 call, it's a blocked driveway, there's something that happens that doesn't necessarily need that emergency response. So having that drone that's already staged allows it to respond to that call, allowing the other patrol officers to, you know, focus 
their resources on other, you know, other calls, other events that may be taking place. So I just wanted to add that, you know, just really hammer home the, the benefit of having that drone that's already staged on the rooftop, being able to deploy it at a moment's notice, even without, you know, the human intervention there, being able to just autonomously de deploy to a known location where there was a call, a gunshot, whatever event that might have taken place. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and we can, I'm sure when we get into the discussion around regulations, come back to what type of regulations are required to do DFR operations. Certainly, uh, Skydio has the um, the hardware and software solution to do it. You have the, the X10 um, flying through 5G. There's unlimited range. It's got the amazing um, camera that, you know, excellent zoom could replace from 800 feet, uh, the high resolution Boson Flutter Plus, you know, 640, 512 um, thermal, radiometric. So all, all the hardware and software to do DFR. But we also found we had the hardware and software capability to do patrol at DFR, which um, sort of is a combination of the two, patrol-led um, deployment and just standard DFR. And I think I cut you off, Aaron, if you were going to add something. Yeah, I really wanted to just focus on, you know, what bringing 5G cellular capabilities into this this uh, trio, um, what that allows. And it's essentially, you know, you no longer are hamstrung to having a cradle point, some type of wireless hotspot. You have that ability that as soon as the drone launches, it's already live streaming the video feed. So you don't have to worry about making sure you have a good connection. And then also on the, the, the DFR approach, you can also take that 5G connection, allow someone back at a real-time crime center, um, to actually take control of that aircraft and conduct that flight. And what's really nice about it is you don't, you're no, no longer hamstrung by that line of sight connectivity to the aircraft. So you no longer have to worry about having the aircraft perfectly positioned, having a good feed to it, anything like that. The aircraft can just independently communicate over the 5G network. So even if it is a very congested environment, you've got a lot of stuff going on on the ground. Once the aircraft's up, it's able to connect to that 5G and it'll still allow these types of operations. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, that's going to be really important as we talk about this next um, deployment method. And that's patrol-led patrol DFR. And it's just a combination of a terms, like I said, patrol-led deployment um, and DFR. So it's not specifically a DFR. Patrol-led DFR isn't designed to get the drone there first per se, although you certainly have the capability to do a DFR operation. But what it is is basically adding remote operations to field-deployed drones. And so you, when you visualize the ability, let's say that you have these drones in the car, you know, officers respond, they can take them out and fly them by hand as usual, um, assess a scene, um, but they could also be flown remotely. So perhaps the, drone, the officer doesn't have the ability to um, manage the drone. You know, they, they, they have plenty to do at the scene, set up a perimeter, you know, join the stack at the door, uh, contact witnesses. There's too much stuff to do at a at a critical incidence rather than stand there and fly a drone by hand. So if you have the system set up where you have a, a remote pilot already back at the station ready to take over, you know, they're just waiting to assist, you can uh, set the drone down and let them launch it. What are some of the elements that you need to make that happen? Um, in addition to the regulatory relief that we'll talk about later, you have to have a drone that can connect via a mesh network like 5G, because you're now you're launching from the ground. You've got tons of buildings and trees between you. And, and uh, you know, if someone was back at, say, a rooftop trying to fly through tr traditional Wi-Fi command and control or C2 link, you're just not going to have a link. So that that uh, unlimited range mesh network is critical. And also you have to have a drone that understands and sees the world around it and avoid obstacles. So, you know, you don't have time to sit there and find a nice clearing. You just got to set the drone down and go as a first responder on the scene. And, you know, worrying about the trees above you and the wires and all the infrastructure, you want the drone to worry about that. Certainly, a, if you're a DFR remote pilot back at the station, jumping into a drone that's just set down at the scene in some cul-de-sac outside an incident, uh, you're not going to be able to know what's above you around you. So having that drone, uh, you know, intelligent enough to avoid all those obstacles and then remotely uh, fly it above an incident and essentially provide the value of a drone and stream that back to the uh, incident commanders or, or others in the field, the supervisor, um, the chief who's off at some conference wondering what's happening at their city. You know, once they have that stream, real-time stream, um, that situation awareness, they don't want to give it up. So all of these, patrol-led deployment, 
uh, DFR, patrol at DFR. They're always to get a drone there quickly, as quickly as possible, and then share that information and make sure everyone understands what's going on, right? Increase situational awareness, reduce response times, save lives, de-escalate situations, etc. Yeah, and I can touch on a couple of the issues real quick that we've seen. Um, there was a, an agency that I was working with on the West Coast that they were using a different aircraft and they had a call. There was someone who was in a hotel room and, you know, they needed to get eyes on that scene. They needed to see into that hotel room, see what was going on with a different drone they were using. They did have that line of sight restriction where as soon as they turned the corner to get to the other side of the hotel, um, they started losing connection. So the, the ground operator had to very strategically place themselves, get a little bit closer to the scene than they would ideally like, especially with a, um, someone who ended up being a shooter in that instance. So the advantage of flying 5G is, you know, once again, you no longer have to worry about having that line of sight. Wherever you need to position that aircraft, um, you can do that, especially in, you know, large metro cities that have very robust 5G networks in place. Um, and then just to, to touch again on that, that point of, you know, being able to fly over 5G, even if it is a congested environment. Um, there was another event that we were working um, with a West Coast agency. It was a large international event. There was thousands of people there. Cell phone signals were were a little bit a little bit jammed. There's a lot of RF flying. There were multiple drones flying. Just a very chaotic environment. But having that ability to fly over 5G allowed us to still have that that signal strength. Um, the 5G that we fly on, specifically with our partner at T-Mobile, allows us to have a prioritization. So even if you are working an event, there's a lot of people on the ground. You can still allow the aircraft to fly over 5G to allow you to get that situational awareness, maneuver where you need it to be. And once again, not have to be constrained by line of sight or positioning or anything like that. So just wanted to bring that up again as you know, the real advantage that we're seeing from 5G on some of these early deployments with the extends. And I'll, I'll add one more, one more thing actually. So I think one thing that differentiates patrol ed from potentially DFR as well as, you know, in some cases, it's just difficult to pre-position drones. Like I think about uh, highway patrols or more rural areas where it's maybe not feasible to position, say, docks around on buildings. There may not be any buildings. So um, patrol ed DFR would, would give those scenarios, you know, give that, that officer or that trooper like a virtual teammate effectively if they're um, out on a call without some of the resources that you might see in cities. Yeah, that's, that's nice to add. That's kind of what we're leading into, right? What does it look like in real operations? Why would someone, what's the advantage of patrol at DFR over DFR? Um, Cause a lot of people are like, I just want to jump straight to DFR, which you may decide to do that. Um, and you can do that with our, our suite, but I think patrol at DFR opens up possibilities for a lot of people who don't see DFR as the first step to take. Like you said, it could be a huge county where there's, it would be forever to get docks that would cover up, you know, or, or uh, launch sites that would cover the whole county. But you can give, um, uh, you know, deputies or officers a drone that can be flown remotely and put that remote pilot to work that's in your real time crime center flying those remote um, operations. For example, uh, and I think you kind of alluded to this, you have someone who's rolls up on a missing child, mom screaming, she's worried about the child walking off into some lake or something. But you also know you got to, you know, search the house and, and clear that out. You're all alone, your cover's 20 minutes, you take your drone out, you set it down, you get on the radio, you ask the DFR pilot to jump in that drone, become your virtual cover. So while they check the area with the thermal, you're inside talking to mom, getting more info, searching the house, and it really instantly scales um, operations. Um, and it also works with a DFR program, right? At some point you can get operational protocols where you launch first from the roof, but then you do battery swaps and do sustained overwatch with the officers on the on the, on the the scene because the drone in their trunk and the drone that launches off the roof are, are the same. They're the same type, they're interchangeable. And so as these, and we're admittedly early stage, you know, no one's really perfected this and, and grown a really robust full system, um, but you can imagine having you know, patrol led deployment, patrol led DFR and DFR operations all together, working together and, and, you know, utilizing the, the, the same suite of products. And Fritz, real quick to your point on, you know, that approach of, you know, having more of a crawl, walk, run, maybe initially starting patrol led, moving to patrol led DFR, and then eventually scaling to DFR. 
the really nice thing about you know skydio products is that you could initially you know buy an x10 that you want to just use for for patrol led dfr have someone remote in to fly it and then down the road if you want to you know upgrade to the dfr approach and get a dock system you can take the same aircraft put it into a dock system so if you initially buy hardware and you're only doing patrol led you can always take that hardware you know, via software upgrades and move it into a different scenario. So the aircraft, you know, you're not going to be hamstrung with starting with patrol of one set of hardware, have to go to different hardware and just keep playing the hardware game. You can start with, you know, a capable X10 and then just upgrade as, you know, as your program evolves, as you're ready to start moving into DFR, patrol led DFR um, and start scaling up. So that's just a really nice advantage of, you know, the Skydio approach to uh, that we take with our hardware and software. Yeah, and I guess at the risk of beating a dead horse, I do have one more layer that kind of this opens up. The hardest part about DFR is kind of carving personnel out to be your DFR pilot, right? Do you have enough work to keep them busy sitting there, you know, launching from a single location, maybe a three mile radius? Is there enough work within the city to make it worthwhile? Would it, that person be better off just, you know, jumping in a patrol car and answering radio calls? Well, patrol led DFR can make that person instantly usable, busy, and flying multiple missions um, right away. And so it becomes economic to take someone rather than put them in a car and answer radio calls, take them out of patrol, put them behind a you know a desk and allow them to remotely operate these drones, whether they're from a rooftop or field deployed, because you could you can easily imagine a drone being thrown up on almost every incident, whether it's a, a domestic violence or a traffic stop or missing kids. Like I said, once the command staff has a stream over these incidents, they're not going to want to give it up and they're going to want us a live stream over everything. And so you can imagine a wall in a real time crime center, all these screens and they're each filled by an ongoing incident. Um, some of which never historically would have required a drone, but once you have that drone up there, uh, you don't want to give it up. Go to the next slide again. Yeah, and I think we touched on all this. Uh, you know, just that real time information is something you you don't want to give up. You want to have that, and that's basically what OKC and all these other agencies are doing is is doing what they can to stand up a drone and get that feed going, whether the drone's there first or after the fact, it still provides value. You want to move into the regulatory discussion? Yeah, absolutely. Like, All right. So, um, yeah, let's, let's talk a little bit about how the Skydio regulatory team is, is working on uh, essentially unlocking drones first responder, making it more efficient uh, and possible. So um, I introduced myself, but I uh, just wanted to put the other two of the, the Skydy regulatory team on a slide quick. So um, I have the, the pleasure of working with Jim Player and Daniel Jenkins, also uh, very experienced in the space. Um, Jim's kind of a, a regulatory legend at this point um, and has been in doing this work for, for longer than me, really. So. Um, it is a small team, um, but we have a lot of experience. Um, you could go to the next slide, please. Um, so, you know, just to kind of hit a couple of the highlights, um, you know, from the group. I mean, we've been past employees of, of organizations like NASA. I mentioned the UAS test sites, kind of working directly with the FAA. We've uh, consulted many drone programs over the years, some very large ones like BNSF and XL Energy. Um, both of those organizations were kind of pioneers in their respective industries um, in Beyond Visualizing Sight and kind of enabled them and uh, helped them get to that point. Um, but we've also worked with small organizations. You know, I mentioned uh, the Sheriff's Department up here in North Dakota, um, which um, over 10 years ago now was like one of the first public safety teams using small UIS. Um, so we've kind of worked with all different kinds of, of organizations. We've worked on just about every type of FAA approval out there from permits on waivers to 91-113 waivers to exemptions, um, kind of you name it. So, um, and, and lastly, we do work kind of with the FAA on a lot of things still. So uh, one example recently was Jim Player was a working group lead on the FAA's 
uh, Beyond Visual Line of Sight ARC, the Aviation Rulemaking Committee. And so like work in those committees and, and like the reports and kind of the re recommendations that are made out of those uh, ultimately inform the FAA and, and help them kind of shape and create the next set of rules. Um, so it's really important work that we're, we're kind of participating in all the time. So our mission at Skydio is kind of twofold. So first, we're always working on creating regulatory pathways uh, for organizations to, to use these systems to, to take advantage of autonomous flight on a routine basis. And we also support organizations in kind of scaling that type of operation because it's one thing to get the FAA approval you know, the waiver in hand, uh, which we're good at, but then it's kind of another thing to operationalize that um, and make it effective. So um, our mission is kind of to support two of the, both of those things. And, and one good example of the first bullet point there is um, our doc product. So um, it, it's kind of always the case that like the technology and the regulations are always kind of this, this back and forth, you know, the tech uh, might have capabilities that that the regulations haven't quite caught up yet, or maybe the regulations take a step forward and then that enables the tech to uh, kind of grow and mature and, and take on new things. So um, so with Doc, you know, we made this kind of leap forward in, in capabilities. Now you can position this Doc in a, in a field or at a, at a site with a drone in it and effectively like a, a click of a button on your web browser, you can launch that drone and, and fly it around and conduct a mission. Um, but all the regulations were kind of centered around, you know, visual line of sight and this like relationship of pilot physically being with the drone. Like it, it wasn't thought about part 107 many years ago where the drone and the, the pilot would be physically separated like that. So, uh, we got creative. We, we worked with a couple, uh, utilities through an FAA program. Um, and we kind of put, put a safety case in front of the FAA on, on actually flying these, these drones remotely. Uh, with no no flight crew on site, no visual observers, no pilot or anything like that, and and we were successful. And we'll, we'll kind of talk about that in a couple couple slides forward. Some of that success, but it's just an example of kind of the work we do, constantly being creative and, and working with the FAA to find safe ways to uh, to do these kinds of operations. So we almost always include the arc of autonomy in in like regulatory presentations because it it just helps us kind of ground ourselves in like where we've been in the past, like what our vision is, and then where we are kind of on this, this journey or this arc, because with, with regulatory things, it really is just kind of this slow incremental progress, you know, year over year uh, that we see. So um, on the left side, like kind of in the past where we've been is this autonomous flight where the pilot is on site and they're, they're sort of on the sticks, you know, actively flying the drone through the, through the environment, through the scene, um, and going all the way to stage five on the right side, which <clears throat> is more of like a future kind of vision where the pilot is actually almost optional in a sense. Like it's more about the drone just kind of being intelligent and responding to calls for service or collecting data in a way that you want. And the pilot doesn't necessarily need to be like directly involved on a flight by flight basis. They can they can take over or sort of make themselves optional. And one example is like, uh, you know, with, with pre-positioned drones and docks, if you had, uh, you know, different types of sensors, Fritz, Fritz mentioned some, you know, shot spotters, such. Um, when those, you know, triggers go off, the drone could maybe initiate flight and just respond to that, that sensor. Uh, but then perhaps when the drone gets there, a pilot wants to <clears throat> kind of enter the loop, take over and maybe fly to position the drone. To get the right angle or, or look for something. So we're kind of on this journey um, and some of it's still a little bit in the future, um, but I just kind of wanted to anchor in that. And so um, we'll go to the next slide here, just a couple examples of like how we've sort of incrementally worked through these stages. Um, Fritz already mentioned uh, tactical BV loss. So <clears throat> that was a concept really pioneered by himself and Chula Vista PD uh, back in 2020. And so this concept, allows a <clears throat> pilot really to fly kind of just beyond visual line of sight. So it is pretty localized to like the scene, to the incident. Um, it does have a 1500 foot lateral uh, limitation to it and then a 50 foot above the ground or structure limitation. 
but the beauty is, is is it's really scalable so it doesn't require extra visual observers it doesn't require you know detect and avoid technology um, it's just the first responder and a, and a drone and, and they're able to fly um, in a beyond visual eyesight way that that wasn't possible before so um, this is kind of like a stage one and two type of, of success. Um, this COA, it's, it's a COA now that you get, and this is available to any agency today. Uh, the FAA has some good guidance on how to um, receive this type of COA. Uh, SkyDare regulatory team can also help you, but this is available. Um, if you don't have one, we certainly recommend it. It's uh, just a nice kind of regulatory pathway to have in your pocket to use um, when, the, when the call needs it. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, and then kind of switching over to enterprise a little bit, but this could still be applicable to public safety. Um, we're talking now about remote operations, and I, I alluded to this earlier. So uh, early last year, we finally had success with uh, two utilities, and again, through an FA uh, program uh, called Beyond. This is Dominion Energy and North Power Authority. Uh, we pioneered fully remote operations with those two. And so this is now a part 107 waiver, but it allows these utilities and many more customers since then to fly uh, docked drones fully remote. So there's no visual observer on the scene. There's no pilot, you know, there at the dock. This is just true remote operations. And we were able to kind of achieve this with really two, uh, two main mitigations. And, and again, this is all about like safety case and with the FAA, it's, how can you fly safely? So uh, the first kind of big one was a concept called shielded operations. This is also uh, similar to tactical BV loss in that you're flying low to the ground and, and kind of close to structures. This just inherently mitigates a lot of the, the air risk out there, just kind of encountering low flying aircraft. Um, there certainly are some, but uh, the vast majority of airplanes don't fly down to 50 feet above the ground or or in that area. So that inherently mitigates a lot of the risk. And then we also use ADSB to detect certain cooperative traffic. So uh, with our dock product, there's a ADSB receiver kind of directly integrated. It gets the signals from these cooperative aircraft and displays that right on remote flight deck. So the pilot has just right in front of them kind of a view of the airspace and aircraft uh, flying in their vicinity and they get alerts if they need to take action. Um, so like I said, this this was pioneered really with those two utilities, but now we have many customers since then. We've got um, some schools, like different security monitoring types of use cases, uh, other types of critical infrastructure, DOTs. So there's definitely many customers using this. Uh, but there, there are some limitations for public safety, um, namely the altitudes, like it may not always work to fly low and close to the ground. Um, but if, if, if that was possible or, or usable for you, that, that then a waiver might work here. Um, and then the other thing is just operations over human beings. So with part 107 waivers, uh, you still have to comply with 107.39. Um, and to say that in reverse, you effectively can't operate over human beings or moving vehicles. Uh, there is some flexibility under COAs. I'll talk about that in a second, but um, that is one limitation um, that may make DFR a little bit more difficult under that type of waiver. Um, so yeah, back to the arc of autonomy that just flashed there. My, my point here is just that we are kind of today, we believe we're squarely in stage three. We're, we're really in this remote operations phase. Um, and kind of depending on, on the, the customer, the use case and, and certain things uh, that is with or without it, visual observers. So it, it just kind of depends, but uh, we believe we're, we're squarely in it um, in there right now. So uh, next slide, please. Kind of talk now just specifically about Petrola DFR. So uh, given all that, we believe that Petrola DFR from a regulatory perspective is possible today with the use of visual observers. So that's kind of the caveat today. Um, and this is possible through a COA called the First Responder Beyond Visual Line of Sight COA or Certificate of Authorization. Uh, so you might see like FRBV loss is the acronym or, or hear those words, but um, this COA is available to agencies today. Um, so you can kind of pursue this and unlock really both kinds of DFRs. And I'll, I'll talk about that in the coming slides here as well. So next slide, please. 
Yeah, one more. So what do what do these FRB last COAs like kind of what are their characteristics? So it's it's worth noting that, you know, COAs can vary by agency. There can be like little things that change, but for the most part, we're seeing some pretty similar characteristics across uh, the, the COAs that all these different agencies are getting. And those are uh, number one, like the jurisdiction, what kind of area you typically get with these COAs. It's typically the, the entire jurisdiction for your agency up to 400 feet in uncontrolled airspace. Or if you have controlled airspace, uh, it's typically up to the facility map grid. So if you look at like your Lance app or uh, the FAs uh, before you fly or visualize it, there's there's your grids and they have numbers in them. And effectively, you can fly up to that number um, without like contacting ETC or, or kind of taking extra steps. Um, so generally, pretty good uh, coverage from these COAs. Uh, the next thing is it does require a visual observer to monitor two miles of airspace around the drone. Um, so kind of two things on the VO. Number one, they, they don't have to be a remote pilot. You know, they don't have to be like trained and qualified in that same way. Uh, we do recommend kind of a, a little bit of training um, on things like phraseology, how to scan airspace, like what their responsibilities are during flight. Um, so they should should have a little bit of training on what to do, but they don't actually have to have a remote pilot certificate um, if you're just strictly using them as VOs. And then the other thing is that the FAA doesn't kind of prescribe where that visual observer needs to be. And that's kind of what allows either like pre-positioned drone types of DFR, like roof launched or patrol led. Is the VO can be up on a roof, the VO could be down on the street uh, by the car. The FAA doesn't prescribe that. They just say that a VO has to scan two miles of airspace around the drone. Um, and thirdly, um, sorry, go back slide actually. The third, third thing is that um, for COAs, there is flexibility to operate over human beings when necessary to safeguard human life. So the FAA doesn't define this. Um, it, it's sort of intentionally flexible to give uh, your agencies, um, some, some leeway and, and kind of almost like do your own risk analysis. Like if there's a call for service where, you know, human life is at risk and, and you think it's necessary to, you know, perhaps fly across that street or fly over somebody on the way to the call, uh, that's kind of your decision to make. Um, if it's maybe less of a priority call and you can just kind of avoid flying over somebody or moving vehicle on the way. Um, you know, that's kind of also your call. So the, the call, the, the language is intentionally vague to kind of give you uh, the ability to make those decisions and, and kind of weigh the risks uh, yourself. Uh, now next slide, please. Yeah, so just to highlight the, the two concepts that this type of COA, this FRB VLAS COA would uh, allow you to do, right? So uh, this model is kind of what, what Fritz was describing as just drone as first responder where the drones are pre-positioned uh, they can be in docks like our skydio dock product up on the roof uh, but somewhere kind of close by there's there's a, a visual observer um, that's there to scan your space around the drone while it's while it's responding to the call and flying and then uh, next slide please or you can go more of a patrol model where that that person with the x10 you know is, is pulling it out of a trunk placing it in, in a spot for, for takeoff and landing, somebody remotely logs in and then that patrol officer becomes the VO kind of on the scene, so to speak. Um, so both models are, are acceptable under this FRB VLAS COA. Yeah, next slide, please. All right, so um, Skydio, like we do have regulatory services, effectively like what myself and, and the team does, um, we can make this kind of really seamless uh, for you to get these types of COAs. So we, we do have a, a service around this, kind of custom to public safety. So getting the, the FRB VLAS COA, it, it does require you to submit an application to the FAA. And you kind of have to submit like your, your safety case, how you're gonna do the operation, how it's gonna be conducted safely to them. And so um, we, you know, one thing that we, the FAA kind of always harps on and irks them a little bit is, like it's not quite good enough to just uh, sort of email the FAA and say, like, I want this FRB VLAS COA uh, without a lot of context. They do expect some work to be done to, to kind of show them and describe to them how you'll fly safely. So um, so our team, you know, we're, we're kind of experts at this. We can put together this 
this kind of set of technical documents on your behalf, so the concept of operation. We always do a risk assessment based on the FAA's uh, SRM, safety risk management policies. Um, so we put this package together for you. We would review it with you and, and kind of walk you through it. We'll provide guidance on submitting it to the FAA. It's kind of a two-step process. First step is an email, and then there's a, a CAPS application. Um, and I'm sure folks on the webinar have heard of CAPS. It's uh, not necessarily a fun system to work through, but um, and if you haven't, uh, you're, you're probably one of the lucky ones so far. Um, but we'll help you walk through that. Um, and then if there were any inquiries from the FAA, like requests for more information, uh, we're there to support. Um, additionally, so, so besides, you know, supporting you in acquiring this COA, we also do offer some guidance around uh, drone program SOPs. So, you know, if, you, if you're an agency that's already got maybe a, a drone team stood up, maybe you're doing like patrol-led deployments, just visualizing the site, uh, we can kind of look at your policies and make recommendations uh, to kind of help you transition to beyond visualizing site. Um, or if you're just really kind of starting and don't have anything quite yet in place, we can, we can give you basically a, a, a good starting point, kind of a template, and then work with you to customize and kind of implement from there. So um, we offer that support as well to kind of help your drone program get stood up um, and, and get into DFR. All right, next slide. So, um, so yeah, the, the first thing then that people usually ask, like after kind of describing some of this is like, I, you know, I don't want to use visual observers. Uh, they're, they're kind of a pain, it's extra cost. You know, it might take away like a, a person on staff that should be doing some other kind of job. Um, so we absolutely acknowledge that like using visual observers is, is not the end goal here. It's not like part of our vision uh, for the future, but it's sort of a necessary step right now um, and where the FAA is at. So just wanted to kind of highlight like some of the work that we're doing now um, and have been doing for maybe the last couple of months already. Uh, so number one is like removing the requirement for that visual observer. We've been actively working this for many years, but specific to DFR as well, we're working that. Um, with kind of two of our, our really uh, key customers, we've helped them submit some applications uh, for safety cases that don't require visual observers. Uh, kind of one strategy is to really leverage the uh, ADSB in component of that and maybe look at types of airspace where ADSB equipage is really high. For example, uh, mode C veils around like the big airports and the big cities in the US. Um, you know, with with the requirement for mode for ADSB broadcasting in those areas, there's a higher likelihood and, and a better safety case around using just ADSB in for mitigation. Uh, so we're looking at that. We're also looking at kind of a specific uh, safety case around uh, the patrol led model and tactical BB loss. So uh, we're looking at adding remote operations into tactical BB loss, and Fritz kind of hit on this as well. Um, but if you think about using like shielded operations flying very low to the ground, using ADSB in, um, we think there's a case to be made that that patrol officer on scene doesn't need to be the VO anymore and can go, uh, as Fritz was saying, can go actually you know do their other duties, go in the house, talk to talk to witnesses, talk to mom, um, you know, be part of that. So. Um, so we're actively working that and hopefully, you know, this is the year we have a breakthrough and we have more information to share on that soon. Um, and kind of separately from removing the VO, we're also starting to look at the concept of one to many or one pilot simultaneously flying uh, multiple drones. Um, so when you think about like scaling this, uh, the more drones you have out in the field, uh, that, it, that can oftentimes come with like more staffing requirements, more remote pilots, you know, sitting in these real-time crime centers being ready to uh, operate drones. So with scale, there's, there's kind of a staffing uh, thing that happens as well. And we think if we can enable one to many, so one pilot now to kind of manage multiple drones, um, that can allow you to scale without having that, that uh, staffing scale as well. So, uh, kind of attempting to make things a little more efficient um, as you scale up. So we're also looking at that, um, you know, nothing concrete on kind of either of these to share today, um, but we are working it and hopefully we'll have more to share soon. 
I think with that, um, I'll pass it back to Noreen to kind of wrap up. Excellent. Thanks. We have several questions that I'm going to tackle here in a moment. So for those listening, if you have any other questions, go ahead and throw them in the chat now so we can add them to the list. But I did want to let you know that we will be having a Scudio Live Ops webinar on February 6th at 1 p.m. Eastern. Um, and that's basically a follow on to this webinar. So we've been talking about patrol led DFR. We've been talking about remote operations and 5G. And in our Skydio Live Ops, we are specifically going to demonstrate that. So we'll make sure we have, you know, the X10 with our 5G capability in one location, and we'll have people in another state in a different location flying the X10 um, via the 5G connection. So um, you will receive an email at some point after this webinar to register for that if you would like to see that live and ask any questions you may have of um, some of our industry experts that come specifically from law enforcement who can speak to the use case for um, patrol at DFR. So now I'm going to go ahead and jump into some of the questions that we've had. Jakey, this first one um, that just came in was when it comes to FAA waivers, does a waiver need to be filled out every time we deploy the drone or do we just apply once and have it on file? Yeah, so with COAs and waivers, really, so either option, it's, it's generally a one-time thing. And then as long as your, your flight operations are kind of in, in compliance with the different provisions and limitations in that COA, it doesn't require you to like go get another one. Um, COAs are typically issued for two-year time periods. Um, waivers are typically issued for four years. Um, so they also have some duration to them. And then if if you do reach the end of that two or four years, you can often renew them without too much hassle. So, um, so yeah, it's just kind of a one-time thing. Yeah. Excellent. Um, anyone on the group that wants to jump in on this to talk about the connectivity architecture to stream to an RTCC or a dispatch center? I can talk a little bit about that. Um, so essentially, like if it's a 5G connection um, and you're live streaming, the live stream, primarily Skydio, we use our own live streaming. So you log into your cloud portal, see the live stream there. From there, you can generate a URL link and you can share it out. Um, the, the, the best workflow, you know, in my opinion, would be that the real-time crime center just has access to Skydio Cloud. That's what would allow them to just instantly see a live stream. If it initiates, they'd be able to see a DFR drone. You know, if it, if it was connected and they were able to take control of it, they would have that ability just directly through the, the live stream portal. If you're using other methodologies though, if there's you know, another platform or third party that you're working with, you prefer sending their live stream there because that's what you're used to. Um, no issues on our side, we have API integrations. We have a lot of customers that currently do that. Um, Axon's a big partner of ours, so that's one that I like to reference a lot, but with their Axon Respond platform, you can have the live stream just go straight you know, via um, controller to some type of hotspot, cradle point, you know, iPhone, cell phone, hotspot, whatever the hotspot will be. And then it'll stream to our cloud and then automatically push to Axon Respond. So if you're used to act using Axon Respond, no, no difference once it's initially set up. If you want to do something even beyond that and use like a mesh network, use Silvus Radio, something like that. Um, we also have the capabilities that the controller just has HDMI out in the back of it. So you can plug HDMI out into um, Silvus mesh radio, some different type of mesh radio that you're utilizing, and then have that live stream just port back over your existing mesh network directly back to your command center. So a lot of different options. Um, we've built out a lot of integrations with third parties. If if you're using a third party or some type of live stream platform that I didn't mention, uh, please reach out to us. Let us know what that is. We likely either have an integration or we can um, get one built for that specific platform. Yeah, thanks for that call out. Um, Skydio has a program called Skydio Extend where we partner with lots of different companies who are relative to our customer base. And so um, a lot of our integrations have come from customers saying, hey, this is my tech stack and this is what I need to integrate with. And so then we just do the work with those companies to make sure we can get it done. Um, so we understand you've got you know fleet management and video streaming and your CAD systems and cloud and I could go on and on. So we have a lot of integrations in place. And if there's just something that you need specifically to work for you, just work with our teams and we can make sure that you get that up and running. Um, Wait, well, you reminded me of some features that we didn't get to say that uh, sort of parallels the question. So not only you can imagine flying remotely from a, you know, a real time crime center or some nice setup desk, 
with a you know computer and monitor but you can also do it from a laptop and you can also take control from another um controller so you can fly the you know someone else could pull their controller out of their you know their hand controller out of the trunk and commandeer that drone and take it over so someone at the scene could launch it fly it traditionally someone else somewhere else anywhere really open up a the same type of controller and then take over the drone and fly it that way. So there's really these capabilities layer on a lot of possibilities of uh, how to operationally integrate these into everyday uh, police operations, only limited by the imagination. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we did have a question about uh, 5G and if we will have first net availability in the future. Um, T-Mobile is who provided us access to their 5G network and so um, when, if and when we get access to, um, t uh, to FirstNet, you know, we'll pursue that, um, but no timelines on that for now. Um, so we had a question about um, someone who doesn't have a drone program, but they do want to do patrol operations, just not really knowing where to start yet. So anyone else want to jump in on this or I can tackle it? Okay, I can take it. Go ahead. Um, yeah, so we'll 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 join in on the journey with you wherever you are. Um, if you do not have a drone program and you're looking to just start with a specialized unit, like we can help you get up and running. Whether it's you're looking for search and rescue or you're hoping to use it for crash and crime, we got you there. Um, and once we get you up and running and you have your policy and procedures in place, we can start working with you toward patrol operations. You want to skip the whole specialized unit you just want to start getting these out into patrol cars we can work with you there too so um, hopefully you are able to figure out through this webinar that we have lots of teams in place to help along the way with the different pieces we've got law enforcement experts we've got drone expertise we've got regulatory expertise we've got so many people that can help with um, developing your program so you're not on your own uh, you just got to let us know where you need to start and we'll help you there and then we'll help you grow to whatever you see for the future of your agency whether that's just patrol led dfr or that's doc based dfr with these docs pre-positioned throughout your jurisdiction will help you get there um, Aaron, this might be a good one for you. Are agencies actually doing patrol-led DFR today, or are they still just operating with small drone units? We do have some agencies that are in the, the infancy stage, um, but now that we have the X-10s, we started shipping them um, late last year. Um, now that they are starting to work their way out into the wild, we have seen some agencies that are starting to take that approach. Um, so if you are you know, that agency, you're interested, you want to hear more of those stories, um, outside of what I can, you know, publicly share here, um, we can definitely have one-on-one -on -one meetings where um, we can introduce you to our to our team here at Skydio, and we can talk more about the the teams how they're utilizing it um, for those potentials. But yeah, we do have some um, that have started in our in the infancy stages of of doing true patrol-led DFR flying over five G networks. Yeah, I think our most kind of broadly known customer that has been doing patrol-led deployments is Oklahoma City. Um, and they ha now have more than 70 pilot, keep me honest, Fritz, more than 70 pilots um, in their patrol division. And so they make sure that they have uh, drones for every shift and for every location. Um, but the 5G operations were only made possible with the release of our X-10. So now agencies like that are transitioning into kind of the next stage where they don't have to have an officer who deploys the drone stuck with piloting the drone. They can just get back to work on the ground with everyone else by giving up control to a remote pilot in an RTCC or a different location. And just to add one more tidbit there, uh, Noreen. Um, so something important you called out there was, you know, a, a new agency starting, but then also we've got, you know, an agency like OKCPD who's scaled up to 70 pilots. I just wanted to call out too that we also have like a full training team that's on site. Um, we offer in-person training, online training, a combination of in-person and online. And then we also offer train the trainer training. So, you know, like if you have a, a solid drone program set up, you want to have one of your drone program coordinators, instructors in charge of it, in charge of onboarding new pilots, um, we can absolutely facilitate there. Even if, you know, you don't even have 107 pilots, you're at the very, very beginning stages of, of exploring drones. We also um, offer 107 training as well. So whatever stage you're at, thinking about your drone program, whether you're ready to drastically scale up and expand the program, or if you've never flown a drone in your life, um, we definitely have customers from all walks of, of, of life there um, that we have a team in place to get them the training, the knowledge, the skills that they need to be able to go out and effectively you know, capture the data they need. 
Yeah, very good. I'm so glad you brought that up. Um, we'll take this last question. I think we've already kind of answered a little bit of this, but the question was regarding the live video feed that's captured. What app or different ways is the stream being picked up and viewed remotely? Yeah, so um, multiple different ways, like we discussed a little earlier. If you have a third party you're already using, you know, we can you can work with our Skydio Extend team. We can make sure we have an integration in place to, to send it. Otherwise, if you're just using the native Skydio streaming, um, it would be the, the um, essentially for the end user, whoever's watching the stream, they really don't need any type of app. They don't need anything special at all. Um, when you send someone a Skydio live stream link, you send it as a URL, which can be opened on a desktop, a tablet, a smartphone, whatever you have that has internet connectivity that can access a browser can view the live stream. Um, what's really cool about our live streams too is if um, you can also turn on expiration links. So if you know, hey, today we're gonna be working in interagency op, we're heading out with this you know, sheriff's department, I want them to have access to anything we live stream today. You could go ahead and send them a live stream link so they already have it. You don't have to worry about sending it. And then you can turn on an expiration. So you can say, hey, we're going to be working with them for four hours. After four hours, let's have this link expire. So that way you don't accidentally forget like, oh, some people are watching my live stream. I don't know who it is. You can turn on those expiration links. So that's another advantage to it. But yeah, there's nothing special needed to be able to view the live stream. Any smartphone, tablet, desktop, anything with a browser can, can view a Skydio live stream. Excellent. Thank you. Well, I appreciate um, the three of you hanging out with me today and talking about patrol and DFR, especially um, the regulatory side. I know those are questions that we get most frequently. To everyone that's joined us, thanks for hanging out with us. We appreciate